There remains a persistent and pernicious notion that ancient experimental science was simply a hodgepodge of nonsense and folly. In fact, the more I study the ancient experimental sciences, for instance, alchemy, astrology, magic, and Galenic medicine, which are now sometimes grouped together as quote-unquote occult sciences, the more I come to deeply appreciate just how systematic and careful these practitioners were. I especially admire their careful approach to the full gamut of human knowledge, from the pure reason of syllogistic deduction to mystical insights culled from dreams had in temples. The knowledge of ancient people is truly a marvel. That keen interest in systematic reasoning is perhaps nowhere clearer than in the relationship between medicine, astrology, and alchemy. In this episode, I want to explore a small domain of this incredibly complicated field, that of astrological medicine, by studying the Kalal Katan, or the Brief Treatise, a small manual written in Hebrew from the 14th century. This manual provides a fascinating glimpse into the historical practice of astrological medicine, specifically the theory of critical days and fevers, but also the logic behind the astrological timing of various medical procedures, especially bloodletting. Of course, the connection between astrology and medicine can still be heard in our modern word influenza when 16th century Italian medical astrologers explained a local epidemic as a result of astral influence and the name stuck. If you're interested in magic, the occult sciences, especially alchemy or hermetic philosophy more generally, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics and esotericism here on YouTube, perhaps you'd consider supporting my work on Patreon, or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I sincerely appreciate your consideration of supporting this channel. So let's turn to the Kalal Katan, the brief treatise, and its systematic treatment of astrological medicine. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. By the composition of the Kalal Katan in the 14th century, medicine and astrology had long been wed. The Hippocratic and Galenic medical theories had recognized that certain illnesses, especially the Quartan and Tertian fevers, appeared with a cyclical regularity and seemed to reach specific crises or critical days in which decisive medical action could decide the fate of the patient. This cyclical regularity of the fevers was a puzzle, and several theories for it emerged early in Greek medicine. The earliest seems to have been a specifically Pythagorean intervention. As you probably know, Pythagoras and his kind of cult, I mean, they killed a guy over irrational numbers once, so there's that. The Pythagoreans held that reality was not only describable in terms of mathematics, but that reality was fundamentally mathematical. The cosmos was arithmos. In this theory, the cycles of the fever's appearance are an expression of this underlying mathematical reality, and that a kind of medical numerology appeared in which treatment was timed to specific days in the crisis cycle based on these arithmetic calculations. Another theory for the fever cycle linked the humoral theory of health, that is, that health was a balance of four fluids in the body, blood, phlegm, black, and yellow bile, 
and that like the ocean tides, these fluids were affected by the location and transits of various astral bodies, especially the moon. In this theory, the medical intervention, typically bloodletting, had to be astrologically timed, especially with the transit of the moon and its relationship with the various malefic and benefic planets. Over time, however, both the mathematical and numerological descriptions provided by the Pythagoreans would be fused with the causal account provided by astrology. Of course, the unification of medicine with astrology is a very complicated matter, but suffice to say that the Ptolemaic account of astral causation, rather than the stars being mere signs in the heavens, proved decisive. In fact, Ptolemy even writes in the Tetrabiblos that the Egyptians, who had the most advanced astrology of his time, had managed to perfectly merge astrology with medical practice. Even Galen, for whom astrology doesn't play a very central role in his medical theories, does admit that Egyptian astrology is, is especially apt when dealing with the critical days of the fevers. However, while Ptolemy does lay down the causal mechanism behind astrological medicine, he doesn't really provide pragmatic medical advice. I mean, he wasn't a doctor, he was an astronomer astrologer. Ptolemaic astrology can be said to provide the why and the when of at least certain kinds of illnesses and treatment, whereas Galenic medicine provides the what and the how. And that's what makes the Kalal Katan so interesting it's just such a synthesis. Though this may be a good time to note that the crisis cycle of the Quartan and Tertian fevers was discovered to be in fact part of the life cycle of the various malaria parasites in the late 19th century. By the way, the name malaria is evidence for the miasmic theory of illness. It literally means bad air, though the disease was primarily found out to be transmitted by mosquitoes. Malaria remains a scourge in most of the developing world with nearly half a million deaths from the disease in 2019 alone, and a viable vaccine has only appeared recently. While previous theories of the etiology and treatment of this illness proved basically incorrect, one must admire the centuries, millennia even, of attempts by medical practitioners to diagnose and treat this terrible illness using the best theoretical and practical tools of their time. Especially amazing is the indigenous Peruvian treatment, which laid the foundations for the development of the anti-malarial drug quinine, which in turn laid down the foundation for the gin and tonic. And we're getting kind of far afield at this point, the importance of anti-malarial cocktails aside. Of course, medical astrology would continue to develop after the Hellenic period, and much like the track taken by alchemy, it was birthed in the Alexandrian world of Hellenism, but really brought to maturity in the Islamic context. Specifically, a great deal of attention was spent studying the specific relationship between the astrological position of the moon, the fever cycle, and its critical days, along with a regiment of specific treatments, especially the timing of bloodletting. Speaking of bloodletting, I actually have in my collection a quite old scarificator from the probably 19th century. You can see here that it's made in this beautiful brass. And of course, as you can see, as I cock the chamber, you can see the little blades pop out, right? You have about uh, three little blades in each uh, area here and I completely can crank it all the way back, right? You can adjust the cut, the, the depth of the cut by adjusting this little crank here. And this will uh, basically slice into your body. So you can adjust it here. You would place this along certain areas of your body like your wrists or your forearms. I'm not going to touch this thing. Do my body with it cranked like that. And then you would depress the trigger and it would lance you. And this would be used for medical bloodletting all the way into the 19th century. It's a beautiful piece, but again, uh, seeing these little blades pop out as I crank it up like that, um, I don't know, fills me with a bit of dread and makes me quite happy 
that this thing is never going to be used on me for any reason, medical or otherwise. Bloodletting aside, to all of this would be added a strong adjunct of astrological herbalism in addition to the use of talismanic magic and the theory of astral rays developed by such luminaries, sorry, as Al Kendi. If you want to check out my episode on Al Kendi's theory of the stellar rays, check out the card above. Of course, medical astrology would also make its way into Jewish circles, though not uncontroversially. Maimonides, the most famed Jewish doctor of all time, and there have been a couple of Jewish doctors through time, even the court physician of none less than Salahadin is famous for his rejection of astrology generally. He even goes so far in a letter to blame the practice of astrology by Jews for the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans. Though what motivates Maimonides' disdain for astrology has more to do with what he takes to be the theological implications of astrology upon Judaism and Jewish law more generally. He basically sees astrology as a kind of gateway drug, so to speak, to star worship and thus idolatry. In fact, the phrase he uses for idolatry in Hebrew is avodah chokhavim, literally meaning star worship. Though this heavy-handed approach is probably also why his condemnation of astrology basically failed. The astrologers of that time perceived what they were doing as basically natural science, no different than studying and predicting any other events given the laws of nature. So it's unsurprising that one of the major treaties on astrological medicine through the Middle Ages, the Sefer HaMerot, would be written by Maimonides' near contemporary Abraham Ibn Ezra. Indeed, Ibn Ezra is likely one of the most important authors about astrology in any language during this period. If you're interested in the attitude of ancient Judaism and Islam to astrology, make sure to check out my episode above about that topic. Really, the Kalal Katan can be seen as a kind of practical digest of the Sefer HaMe'erot, and to it we turn now. As I mentioned earlier, the Kalal Katan, or the Brief Treaties, is a concise digest of astrological medicine meant specifically for use by physicians who aren't themselves experts in astrology. The text was composed by David ben Yom Tov, himself an accomplished astronomer-astrologer, this is apparently a vocation that ran in that family to some degree, who lived in the region of Catalonia in the first half of the 14th century. Interestingly enough, we actually know a lot about his divorce from his second wife, Esther. His first wife apparently went insane. Because it was rather messy, with numerous rabbis entering into the fray of the divorce. So, a little medical astrology and not a little drama. It sounds like a perfectly good grounds for a new show on Netflix. The text survives in four Hebrew manuscripts and one Latin translation, showing that the text enjoyed some popularity despite medieval astrology never playing a really central role by Jewish physicians. Yom Tov notes that astrology describes astral influence or change more generally upon the sublunar world, and so too medicine describes the change from health to illness, and thus the two are complementary. However, because both medicine and astrology are so very complicated, few people these days have the ability to learn both sufficiently. Thus, Yom Tov was asked, it seems by a doctor friend of his, to produce this little manual, and in it he introduces some of the basic notions of astrology, and especially urges the physician reading the text to learn the fundamental planetary calculations, though one may need to consult prepared tables for the more difficult calculations, for instance, of Venus and the Moon. Of course, the moon is especially important in all this because it relates to the fever cycle and the important elections during the fever crisis, or what is called the critical days. These tables were actually appended to the original text, though they are now found in separate manuscripts, 
and they contain specific astrological correspondences with parts of the body, the use of bloodletting, purgatives, and emetics, along with various positions and transits of astral bodies. The core of the text, as I mentioned, focuses on the moon and the practice of bloodletting from various parts of the body. Though there is also attention until the end of the text on the role of the various malefic and benefic planets when considering a medical intervention. As I mentioned earlier, medieval medicine saw health as a harmony of four humors with an excess of hot blood causing fever generally. Thus, according to this theory, as the fever cycle comes and goes, it's correct to let blood from the correct region of the body under the right astrological sign to forestall the fever and the illness more generally, thus restoring humoral balance to the patient and curing them. Of course, Yom Tov warns the reader that despite his advice, other factors are also always at play that can cause the illness to persist, specifically the natal chart of the patient and obviously whatever sins that patient has committed, thus earning them the ire of, well, God, obviously. Further, the illness is said to be a battle between the inherent curative power of nature and the potential for weal or woe in astral influence, which may or may not prove decisive in a given case. It's also interesting that the text provides the reader with a specific list of mistakes that reveal a physician's ineptitude vis-a-vis -vis basic astrology, and Yom Tov advises that if one notices that such a mistakes are being made, then it's high time to, well, get another doctor. I mean, there's malpractice, and then there's astral malpractice. All in all, this brief text is a fascinating glimpse into the intersection of medieval astrological medicine. It's quite nice that it's published in a wonderful edition with a strong introduction, a critical edition of the Hebrew and Latin text, and includes copious notes and those astrological tables that I mentioned earlier that were drawn up by Yom Tov, along with a very careful English translation of the text. It's also a fascinating glimpse into the world of medieval Jewish astrology, given how few texts have been translated so far into English, though that is changing, especially because of the pioneering work of scholars like Shlomo Salah. But those books are published by, you guessed it, they're published by Brill. So I hope you can get as skilled in alchemy as you could do in medicine and astrology. Make sure to subscribe, check out my other content, and again, perhaps consider supporting my work of making scholarly and free content on topics and esotericism available here on YouTube by taking a look at my Patreon or maybe with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and thanks. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.